All right, good morning. morning. We'll get started here in Ezra. And Ezra is a book that flows right out of Chronicles. So it timeline-wise, as we're clicking through some of these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, in fact, by several scholars, believe they were written as one book. So in the Jewish look at scripture, they put Ezra and Nehemiah as one book. We have them separated, and I think they should be separated because there are two lists in Ezra and Nehemiah that are virtually identical. If they would have been written one book by one person at one time, I don't think you would have repeated it in that short of a time period. So I believe it's two separate author, uh, two separate books, very possibly the same author, okay? So in Ezra, our author we are proposing here it's not specifically stated, but uh, both Jewish and Christian historians believe Ezra is one who wrote it. And in chapter 7 through 9, we see I kind of pronoun, so it's written from the first person. Um, and certainly Ezra was somebody as a, both a priest and a scribe would have had the capabilities and had access to all kinds of other people's records too. So we believe Ezra is most likely the writer. The setting. The setting is at this time in the world's history, Babylon has taken Judah into captivity, okay? So because, as you recall, Babylon took all of Judah, the southern tribe, into captivity 586 B.C. So Babylon was the world power. When we come here to the end of uh, Second Chronicles and the first of Ezra, it now talks about all of a sudden it transitions to Cyrus, the king of Persia. All right. So what this is is that a number of years have passed, and Babylon is no longer the world power, but Persia is, and Persia is going to allow, under the rule here of King Cyrus, is going to allow the Jews to go back to rebuild the temple and the city. So in this process, we see God's hand, even with changing dynasties, one country, Babylon, now Persia. God has not forgotten his people. And that is the setting that we see. The date is probably written roughly around 450 BC, okay? So roughly, it could be 457, it could be 444, it's somewhere in there, I just picked the middle number. And we know that because of historical digs and all, too. We know when some of these kings reign from multiple sources. So we're pretty sure that's about the date when it would have been written. The purpose of the book is to encourage the post-exile Jews, those who have been carried off into Babylon, who are still living, and then those who've been born, who all they knew was captivity from another uh, government, to encourage them to follow God and his word, and that he had not forgotten about them nor his covenant with them. So it was to encourage those post-exilic Jews and to let them know God was still on their side. Well, once we see the purpose, I'm going to give you one unique feature, and you'll see this came from uh, Dr. Wilmington's Bible Handbook. Ezra is one of two books of the Bible that contain a significant amount of Aramaic, a sister language to Hebrew. The other is Daniel, okay? So these two have... All kinds of um, passages back there. These have all kinds of um, Aramaic verses within them and Aramaic texts because the Bible was written primarily in Hebrew and Greek with some Aramaic. All right. So this book, along with Daniel in the Old Testament, contain the, the Aramaic. The outline you see there is from Warren Wearsby, a simple outline, the nation is restored in the first six chapters, the people are rededicated in seven through 10, and, and the way he outlines it. The way I do it, of course, will be a little bit different, but I wanted to give you something that you could hang <coughs> some things on there too. So when we get to chapter one and two of Ezra, we come to the repeating of the last few verses of Chronicles, which is, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent the proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, and then I love this, he says this, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, 
The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men in that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So, understand, the king of Persia is a pagan king. All right? When you read this, you go, oh, he's a godly man. No, he's a pagan king. All right? When he says that this is the God of Jerusalem, what he meant is it's the God of Jerusalem. The God of his city was his own God. Because he's a polytheist. He believed in all kinds of gods. And yet, what does God do? He takes and he works through even lost evil people in order to accomplish his mission. So the first thing here, the king is given the idea to allow the Jews to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, All right. The one thing that struck, struck me on, on this particular, the entire thing, at what points in history have you heard of a captured people being allowed to go back and rebuild it? Ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, literally, even the thought of a captured people being allowed to go back with them pleading, begging, and revolting is just unheard of. And yet God works and moves here. Again, purpose of the book, to show the post-exile Jews he's not done with us yet. All right? He's providing for. Pardon me? He's providing for. Yeah, we're going to get there, too. So number B, the king funds the return by telling the Persians to donate their valuables to the Jews. Plus, he returns many of the items taken by the Babylonians when they captured Judah. All right, so this is reminiscent of what? The Exodus. When God said to the children of Israel... All right, right before you get ready to, I'm going to get you out of here. I want you to do this. And you recall in that story of the Exodus, what happened is the Passover was instituted. All right, that was the first Passover. It comes back into play here in Ezra some more. And in the Passover, they were to spread the blood over the doorpost and the death angel passed over. Those had, who had not done it, the firstborn son was killed by the death angel that night. As a result, the Egyptians handed all that they could hand of gold and silver and other things to the children of Israel and said, please get away from us. And thus God funds what he begins in the Exodus. Well here, guess what's happening? It's a mini Exodus. Out of Persia, back to Judah. And how does God fund it? Same way. The king actually this time tells the people, donate to it. All right, give your stuff to them so those people can go back to Jerusalem. Ridiculous provision of God. No, no common sense does this fit into other than God sovereignly moving and working among even lost people? All right, then number C, close to 50,000 total Israelites make the four-month journey from Babylon to Jerusalem, all right? About 900 miles, all right? 900 miles, and we're not talking highway, interstate, okay? And 900 miles is quite a trek in ancient world time. Still pretty good trek today, even with interstate. It'll make you... Uh, wish you went to start it on it and flown, okay, if you drive 900 miles, because I've done that a few times. Um, almost 50,000 Israelites make this trip, and the next thing that happens, number two there, begins in chapter three, which is God moves the people to re begin rebuilding the temple. So, first of all, the heads of the households gave willingly of their own, their own resources to help fund the project. In chapter two, verse 68, it talks about, according to their ability, they gave to the treasury for the work. Um, what we see here is the idea of people that are going to be involved in rebuilding were also donating of their own resources, all right? They're committed to it. Um, and any time that somebody is hyping you to do something, it's always good to find out if they are also in, all right? And so here we see the leaders were in this project. Then number B, Jeshua and Zerubbabel spearhead the building of an altar in order to begin the sacrificial system of the law. All right, so these two dudes are guys that are going to show up again. They are leaders, and they're the ones that the first thing they decide to build is an altar. Now think about it. We've got no temple, and the first thing they decide to do is build an altar. And here's why. Because they could get an altar done pretty quickly, first of all. And second of all, it would allow them to begin to practice the sacrificial system that God had instituted for the Jews 
from the time of the giving of the law of Moses of all that was supposed to be done. So they begin to build this altar, and then take a look at verse 3 of chapter 3. It says, So they set up the altar on its foundation, or pedestal, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. All right, so notice what it says. The people were terrified of the surrounding neighbors because they built this altar. That wasn't such a big deal because it wasn't that gigantic. But guess what happened? The minute they got it built, they started to offer sacrifices. So now all of a sudden, the altar's in use. Now think about it. This used to be the homeland, but it's been inhabited by all kinds of other people. In fact, a mismatch of people. And you've rolled back in, and you just built this altar, and now you're burning animals on it. All right? There is definitely the idea of what are these people going to do to us? They're terrified. I'm going to tell you this. When you begin any new work of God, and to these people it was new, there is often terror associated with First time you open your mouth to speak about the love of Christ and how he has paid the price for your sin, there can be terror in your heart. I'm telling you, God will move you right through it. All right? So we can be terrified of a number of different things. God is sovereign. He's in control. And these people, they were shaking when they lit the first match. All right? And they were looking around like, what's going to happen? Sovereign God is in control here. So the people were terrified. Then number two, once began or once begun, the sacrifices never ceased for the forgiveness of sins occurring morning and evening plus various special days. So they begin sacrificing and this starts occurring morning, evening, and the various special days. This altar is constantly in use. All right. By the way, Old Testament, all of this sacrifice, all this continual daily, morning, evening, special days, holidays, it was constantly in use. Which, when you get to the beauty of the book of Hebrews and you see that Jesus Christ is the sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of an angry God and was all these sacrifices pointed to the perfect fulfillment of the sacrificial system in Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. All right? He paid the price for our sins. This was meant to show you're a sinner and you need a lamb. Pointing to you are a sinner and you do need the lamb of God, the very Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. My Lord. So once they started, they kept going. Well, the next thing that happens in chapter 3, number C, is the building of the foundation. So the next thing is the building of the foundation. All right? Same thing today, by the way. You go to build. I mean, you don't start building the house until you have the foundation. I mean, it's the very basic. So now when we get into 1 Peter and it talks about the foundation being Jesus Christ and the first stones being the apostles, then you as living stones are being built up into the very house of God. All right, so this idea of building, we all understand you must have a foundation. Otherwise, if you're putting it on the sand of the outer banks, guess what's going to happen? It's washing away unless you <coughs> have built it on a sure foundation. So the foundation goes to be built. Notice it would have taken some time to acquire the desired materials and have them transported to the site. So it's about a seven month time period from foundation um, to now we're getting ready to build the house, all right? And so there's a there's time period that's going to occur. And notice when they get the foundation actually built, look at verses 12 and 13 of chapter three. It says this, yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of father's households the old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. So you got this picture. The old guys that had been there and seen the first temple, when they're celebrating the laying of this foundation, they wept. And the reason they wept is they said, Look how far from the glory of the first temple this is. All right? When Solomon built the first one, they knew what it looked like ultimately, and now we're rejoicing over this rudimentary foundation being built. 
So the ones who hadn't seen the first one rejoiced because why? God had given them this much victory. They were terrified to begin with, and God had let them get to this point and get this thing built. But the other guys were like, wow. And in their head has to be the things that are disobedience cost us. All right? Because the glory that we once had was in the past. All right, so what happens? Anytime you start doing something, this is also pretty much a truism. Um, number three, God allows opposition to the rebuilding of the temple and the city. God allows opposition. Have you ever started out with something and felt opposition when you go to do anything? Right? i got to tell you that 50% of pastors quit every Monday. All right, Monday morning is tough because so much goes into the study and execution and delivery of a message that on Monday morning, you wake up and you have things like this go through your head. I don't think anybody's paying attention at all. I don't think I'm making any difference. Um, in fact, not only do I not think I'm making a difference, I think all I'm doing is making people mad at me and they hate me and I'm going to crawl in the hole and I'm going to quit. All right, this is the difficulty of ministry. So I'm picking on pastors here because I know that to be the case. But I also know this in our own lives that you can be working with two, three-year-old kids, all right, where you feel like, man, I'm wiping noses and I'm cleaning diapers and I'm, and then some parent comes in and, and just rips you because you know the hair wasn't combed or what, whatever it was. And so opposition is part of service. <laughs> All right, you're going to get some opposition. So you either fold or you get back up and you say, all right, let's go. Um, so here the opposition comes. First, the nations who lived in the land offered to help rebuild the temple. So at first, the other surrounding people say, hey, we see you doing this. Let us help. Well, the leader said, no, God commissioned us to do it. We're going to do it. So the Jews said, no, we don't want your help. Now, why did they offer to help? Two, two thoughts. I think one of two things. One is, is they hope to infiltrate the thing so they can sabotage it, all right? Because no question, one of the best ways to wreck something is to pretend like you're in it and then, you know, conveniently make things go awry. The second thing would be they saw this activity and they saw the opportunity for some money, all right? Because there's work being done. So the idea of maybe collecting some money for it. So one of the two, the Bible doesn't tell us why, what the motivation was, but I'm pretty sure it was all those two. Or a combination and, of the two. Or a combination of the two could very well be. There were some valuable things that had been brought back. Maybe they just wanted to steal them. We don't know for sure, but they were rebuffed. So number two, their second attempt is they probably threatened the workers or the family's lives if they kept working on the temple. It says they harassed them, and it was one of those things where of uh, New York City for years and years and years the mob ran New York City so there was a company I read this book called Running Through Walls written by David's cookies it wasn't a believer it was just a business book but David wrote this David as in David's cookies wrote the book he opened up a store in Manhattan and the minute it opened the New York Times reviewed the cookie so it was the best cookie in the city once that review happened, people lined around the street. He couldn't make cookies fast enough. And so literally, I mean, he was just swamped. Well, after a couple of months, Guido shows up and says, uh, you owe us 50,000 uh, because the cookie shop down the road has an uh, exclusive for the area. He just total shakedown by the mob. So this idea of threatening was this. It's very simple. It's always the same tactic. Either you pay, or you're going to pay. Okay, we'll either burn you down, or we're going to break your legs. And David ponied up the 50 grand. All right, in this story, David's cookies, he ponied up 50 grand to hopefully keep the mob from coming back for more. So in this case, these people were harassed now. At first they said, hey, we'll help Bill. Now it says they're harassing him, probably threatening their lives. Maybe their kids, maybe their families, what have you. Um, number C, when that didn't work, they resorted to lawyering up. All right, lawyering up, which means they're sending official complaints to the rulers back at headquarters. So they got some official documents, sent it back, and said, hey, these evil and rebellious people, these Jews, 
Uh, if you go back in history, you'll find that they're very rebellious and they're rebuilding their city. They're going to rebel against you, King, and they're not going to pay the tribute and the tax, and you are going to be sorry. All right? They sent that back to the king. Now, here's the interesting thing. Ezra doesn't give us all the time periods in here, but we can deduce from history and other passages of Scripture. Number D, the work actually is stopped for about 15 years. Okay? So when you read Ezra, you just breeze right through it, and you don't see those time periods. Why? Because Ezra is most concerned with telling the story that a providential God will accomplish his purposes. All right? So he's not trying to recount all of history. He's trying to get the story and we're going to see more of that story when we get into uh, Nehemiah. We're going to see more of the story in Haggai. We're going to see more of it in some of the prophets where this will be discussed. But the work actually was stopped by the government for 15 years. And then, number E, Darius, another pagan king, all right, reaffirms the original decree that the Jews were to rebuild the temple and even uses tax money to help fund it while telling the adversaries to stay away. All right, so a different king goes and digs up the decree from, the, from our first king. So he finds the decree of Cyrus. He looks at it and goes, hmm, I'm, I'm reinstating this, plus I'm actually going to tax the, my people in order to help fund it. And then he officially said to the people who sent him the letter, the lawyering letter, said, don't mess with those people. Stay away from them. Okay? So he was giving them protection as well as funding. Once again, we're back to the ridiculous, sublime, providential hand of God. And even evil kings are like putty in his hand. He decides to turn, he will. All right? And he certainly can. All right, so what happens Number four, Roman number four, God moves all obstacles and the temple is completed. So we get to chapter six and we get to a completed temple. Uh, in the first few verses there, Haggai and Zechariah are credited with being important prophets in encouraging the people to do the work of God. Encouraging, you might even say exhorting. So when we get to Haggai and Zechariah, we're actually going to be revisiting this time period in history. And you're going to see those writers encouraging the people to do the work and to follow God. By the way, they're also going to say, part of the reason you've had so many troubles and struggles is because of your rebellion against God. Again, as we <laughs> talk about the people's rebellion, he's only talking big picture, providential God, and he's accomplishing his purposes. All right? So we're going to see more detail shown in this when we get to the books uh, a little bit later in the Old Testament. So in encouraging and exhorting the people to do the work of God. Um, our coach is necessary in the National Football League. Our coach is necessary. Wouldn't it just be the best guys who would beat the other best guys? I mean, it's just a matter of your talent level? Uh -uh. In fact, coaches are paid just as much, in some cases, more than players because of the importance of somebody to encourage, to push, and exhort somebody to do more than what they could have thought they would have done on their own. I always come back to uh, my baseball playing days when you'd have the bases loaded, a pitch would come inside, and you'd duck out of the way, and from the bench, invariably, your buddies would say, take one for the team, <laughs> all right? Meaning, let the ball hit you, because when it hits you, you get to take first base, and now a run comes in. The idea of getting plunked on purpose with the baseball is counter to your uh, desire to preserve life, because it doesn't <laughs> feel good. But coaching and teamwork and exhorting and encouraging go together. By the way, God says, Hebrews, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but all the more as the day you see approaching. Because we need corporate exhorting and encouraging. All right, we need it. They needed it then, we need it still today. All right, so the person says, well, I can worship God just fine off at the lake with a fishing pole, looking at the beautiful streams, alive from the pit of hell. You cannot worship God properly unless you are corporately involved with worship in an intimate fashion with other people. All right? Same thing here. We need that exhortation, that encouragement. Then, where are we? B, the temple was completed a little over 70 years after having been destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. All right, so 
70 years after it was destroyed, it's completed. About 70 and a half years that it's completed. We can deduce that from a number of different sources. It sounds like a government contract. Yeah, it does sound like a government contract. <laughs> or highway, highway construction around major cities. Number C, the dedication is consummated with sacrifice, but at a fraction of the amount of the sacrifices that Solomon had offered because the nation was not nearly as wealthy. All right, this was a very poor group of people compared to the days of Solomon. So in Solomon, we saw upwards of 130,000 animals sacrificed. I mean, we're talking the blood in the Kidron Valley must have been knee deep that surrounded Jerusalem. And so Kidron Valley can't help but point out. All right, so the valley from this picture taken from the Mount of Olives, before you get to the city walls, there is a natural valley there, Kidron Valley, all right? That's where the blood, no doubt, would have been running in that Kidron Valley. On this side, where I'm, where I'm standing, vantage point of Mount Olives, is a cemetery, which is a Jewish cemetery. The ones right up to the wall, that is a Muslim cemetery. The reason the Muslims put it right there, that gate that is closed up is the Eastern Gate, or the Beautiful Gate, which Jesus said he was going to re-enter when he came back. So they built a cemetery right in front of it because they said no good Jew would ever walk through a cemetery, all right? So all of that Kidron Valley stuff you'll see when you go to Jerusalem with me. Now, next thing is, number D, the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread follow at the God-appointed times, signaling the call of the nation back home to worship. All right, so as we continue in this passage, it says, not only did they start doing the daily sacrifices, but at the prescribed time when Passover was to occur, and Passover was to celebrate leaving Egypt, we already mentioned, it was, it was to commemorate it, all right? By the way, God likes things to commemorate, thus the Lord's Supper. That's why we take the bread and the juice and we commemorate his death until he comes. So this idea of why, because God knows we need to be reminded, all right? And the fact is, is that as Mark Dever says, it is the church visible. It is one of the ways we can make a visible picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary in his offering for our sin. All right, so it is a clear call to the nation back home because once that altar and once that temple and once those sacrifices are going, Passover was was the time when everybody who could possibly come was to come to Jerusalem. You understand? This is like end of exile. You're supposed to come home. Now, go to the politics of the day. Is there's people that say, well, the Jews have no right to be in Jerusalem because the, the Muslims were there first. No, you just haven't gone back far enough. All right? Um, this land. If you're going to go back to the original, you know who it goes back to? The Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, the Jebusites. You know how many of those are left? That would be zero. God preserved the nation of Israel in spite of not having a homeland for hundreds and hundreds of years. He did it multiple times. All right? Pardon? Thousands. Yes, thousands. Yeah. Because <laughs> in 70 AD, we see the end of Jerusalem again when we move forward. Jump, we jump forward 500 years. And we're going to see the ruler, Rome, now is the king of the world. And Rome bulldozes, sets the city on fire, just like it happened in the Babylonian times. From 70 AD, the rebellion is completely squashed in 75 AD on the hill of Masada. Up until 1948, the Jews had no homeland. And yet maintained themselves as a people. Providential hand of God, or just love. Atheist Jews believe it's just luck, by the way. They believe it's because they're gritty people. They're tough. I think it's because of the sovereign hand of God. All right, where am I? Number five, Roman number five. The next thing that happens is God moves a second batch of Israelites back to Jerusalem. So what happens here, between five and or between six and seven, um, 57 years pass from the end of chapter six to the beginning of chapter seven. All right, we got a new king. All of a sudden, we're introducing a new king. It's 57 years. We know that again because of archaeology and because of other passages of Scripture. Combine it. Everybody knows the numbers are, are right. So 57 years pass, and this king is going to basically reaffirm what the other kings have said, which is you go back 
to the land you rebuild. Um, back to Jan's statement, this is ridiculous that a captive people would be allowed to go back to their place other than the providential hand of God. Now, we are also introduced, number B, to Ezra. Ezra is a priest in the line of Aaron. All right, we're introduced to him. So Ezra has an Aaronic or a line of Aaron, meaning high priestess kind of high priest kind of line. And so we're talking about a guy who has the right lineage. Not only does he have the right lineage, but I also want to point out four things about Ezra here. The first thing the Bible says about him is the hand of God was on him. The hand of God was on him. By the way, this is the first time this phrase is used, but it's going to be used, I think, seven more times in Ezra and Nehemiah. The hand of God was on him. I can promise you this. If the hand of God is not on you, you're not going to be real super successful in spiritual warfare. All right? You can be successful like Donald Trump, bring it to today's world. Donald Trump, very successful in world business. Donald Trump, not successful in the spiritual realm. All right? Not a believer. Thus, he's not successful in a spiritual realm. But here we see Ezra says the hand of God was on him. Um, number two, he was an expert in the Mosaic Law and he loved to study. And I want to look at chapter 7 and the way it's worded. It says this, verse 6 of chapter 7, Ezra went up from Babylon, he was a scribe, skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all he requested, because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And it also says, verse 10, Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. All right, so you, did you see the other thing in there is he not only was an expert, but he loved to study it. God put in his heart to love to study it. You'll find that uh, virtually anybody that I've ever known that has teaching or preaching kind of gifts loves to study because if you don't love to study, it doesn't go with the gift. You have to love to study. So one way that I know God's gifted me to teach is because I, I love to study. Okay, the truth is, is that my sinful nature would be to go study and never come to see anybody to present. My <laughs> sinful nature is I love studying more than I like delivering. Okay, so understand, my, my tendency is to crawl off in a hole by myself and say, I really don't want to mess with you guys because you're all a mess. Because guess what? We are. We're all a mess. Hold the mirror up and I see me and I go, man, you're a mess too. We all are a mess. Thus we need the perfect law of liberty shining back into our life to expose the areas that need correction. He loved to study. Not only did he love to study, but number three, he was a teacher of those truths. So Ezra was a teacher of those truths. Folks, every one of us should be a teacher of the truths that are in the law of God. Now, in some cases, it could be that you're just teaching them to your own kids to begin with. Then it might be you might be teaching four or five-year-olds. It might be that you're teaching the neighbor who has just become a believer. The fact is you know more than somebody, and thus you should be teaching. You go, oh, wait a second, I don't know all the answers. Well, guess what? Clint and I don't need it. Okay? Not even close. In fact, the more you study, the more inadequate you feel to attempt to accurately divide the word of truth. So I'm telling you right now, don't let your fear keep you from teaching the truths to other people. As God reveals truth to you and as you get it, be willing to share that truth with other people. All right? It's part of what the body is supposed to do. Then, number four, he practiced what he preached. He practiced what he preached. How important is that? You know, to me, um, <coughs> it is the, most important. It, the congruency of practicing what you preach is the difference in effective communication and something less than that. The fact of it is, is that when you get up to teach, if you have not been worn out by the passage and acquiesced to it, then your communication is going to be less than authentic, all right? So Ezra's a good guy, all right? He's a good guy. This is a guy whose skill, devoted to, to teach, has practiced what he's teaching. He's going to lead the nation here in a spiritual sense, in a big way. 
Then number C, we get to Artaxerxes. Okay, this is our new king. Issues the decree for any and all who desire to go. This is like, hey, all you people didn't go before. Time for you to head back to Jerusalem and then to Judah. All right? Time to head back. He issues the decree. And once again, financed by the government, people, and additional items found that came from the first temple. So what happens here is it says he sent back some more stuff that Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon had taken from the temple. It's like they found more stuff. Or maybe somebody was hiding it. I don't know, but they found more stuff and sent it back. Not only is it, again, donations from Persian people, the government is donating additional items from the temple, but then he also does this. He says, by the way, as they go, nobody in the kingdom should charge any of those people a tax, tribute, or a toll. In other words, no tax or fees were to be levied on the children of Israel as they moseyed their way back 900 miles back to Israel. So now he's even protecting them from the shakedown on the road. All right? Again, providential hand of God is the only way you can explain. A godless, polytheistic king issuing decrees to help the children of God get back to rebuild their city and their temple. All right, then number three, not only does he do that, but then he looks at Ezra and he gives Ezra judicial responsibility and authority to carry out the law of God among the returnees. So he basically says, hey, you take care of it. When you go back over there, the laws, you enforce them, you have the authority to do so on your people. All right, so this is just a fascinating picture again. What is Ezra doing in this book, remember? He is giving hope to post-exile Jews. Those who had blown it, that were alive, those who had been born after it had been blown by those people, to say, I'm not done with you yet. I am still involved with you. You're still my covenant people. In spite of your disobedience, I am here. I want you to obey and be blessed. All right? There's the message, and Ezra is going to show that that's indeed what is going to happen. All right, so we get to, I get all the blanks. The next thing we get to is Ezra's preparations for the journey. Ezra's preparations for the journey. Anytime you go anyplace, there is some preparation to be done, correct? I mean, there's at least some. Now, some of you are, you have a 10 o'clock flight, and at 8 o'clock you go, oh, i got to prepare for this. <laughs> I mean, some are like that. Others of you begin planning a week or two before <coughs> and begin plotting and scheming. We have some friends who we keep their dog for them. They've got a one-year-old and a four-year-old. And so they're going to the beach with in-laws, outlaws, family, whole thing. And she posts a picture on Facebook, and it's a picture of the back of their, like, Tahoe kind of vehicle. And she says, when you have to rent a trailer to go on vacation, I think something's wrong. And there's a U-Haul trailer that she's attached. And her little boy or four-year-old is standing there. And there's you can see there's floats and there's this and there's that all packed in there. All right? Because prepared to go to the beach takes some preparation. Well, you're going to travel 900 miles with a group of people. There is some preparation. But I think you'll be interested. Ezra's preparations don't revolve as much around the U-Haul as they do a spiritual inventory. So the first thing is, look at once the king gives this awesome decree, Here's how Ezra the, the, uh, describes his feelings in verse 27 of chapter 7. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to adorn the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and has extended loving kindness to me before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes. Thus I was strengthened according to the hand of the Lord my God upon me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So the first thing Ezra does in his preparation, he gives thanks to God. All right, he gives thanks to God for the opportunity. Uh, not a bad way to start the day, by the way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The model prayer of Jesus begins with praise of the Almighty just for being who he is, all right? It is to praise him for who he is and what he has done. But if you don't think he's done anything, let me praise him for who he is. Hallowed be his name. So he begins with giving thanks to God. Then the second thing is, he enlisted leading men to go with him, all right? Always good to enlist other men who are leaders to go with him, and that's what he did. Number three, in chapter eight, we see that he begins to pray and he prayed and fasted for God's hand of protection. So on the journey, he prayed for God's hand of protection. By the way, he, he deliberately didn't try and make this 
ask the king, like, can you put some military with us? Okay? Can you send a garrison or two in front of us and on the side of us? Because travel in these days was about like trying to pass from North Chicago to South Chicago. It's dangerous, all right? There's a good chance you're going to get robbed or shot at. So it was a dangerous place to travel. He wanted to trust in God. So he prays and fasts for God's protection. And the fourth thing, he divided the valuables, enlisting multiple priests to carry them to the temple. I find this fascinating because it says very specifically, he divided the valuables that were given to him by Artaxerxes, remains from the other temple, gold and this, that, and the other. He divided it among the priests to carry it back. You could say multiple reasons. One, to divide the workload and the weight. Two, to actually not put all of your eggs in one person's basket in case one priest wasn't as honest as he should be. In fact, there was a check-in system back at the temple to make sure it all was turned in. All right? Third thing could have been, you know what? I'm praying for protection, but in case we have some opposition along the way and somebody gets taken, it's not all lost. All right, so here's what I take from this. I think we should pray and plead and prepare and trust, but also do everything common sense would dictate that we should do. All right? So here's what I believe. I believe it is absolutely the place to start. God, protect my family and our home. But I also think it's a really good idea to have some loaded artillery to deal with anybody who happens to come in to want to try and hurt someone. All right? That's what I believe. I believe prepare and praying do not mean that you then say, well, I just stand here in the middle of the road and trust God not to you know, run me over. Now, common sense comes into, into play here. So Ezra's preparations are not as much about the physical, just that last one, the rest were spiritual. Well, then we come to chapter 9, and through the form, humanity rises its head. Even in Ezra's story, mixed marriages have occurred in the land. Meaning, when the children of Israel were first told by God to go in and to take it, they were not to intermarry with the pagans of that area. All right? Now, understand something here. This is not about race. All right? They were all of the same Semitic. They're all the same culture. It's all Mideastern. It was about the religion. It was about the fact these were pagans. They were not to intermarry with them. All right? What happens here is uh, 110 or so are listed that intermarry with some of the pagan women. So what happens is sin in the camp is revealed. All right? Sin in the camp is revealed. Somebody came forward probably because Ezra, being an expert in the law, had begun to teach it as soon as he could. And they probably went, uh, we've got a problem here because you've got Levites and priests and other people that have married Canaanite women or other pagan women. So what happens is, Ezra's brought, brought, is, this is brought to his attention, and he does what is indicative of repentance in those days. He tears out some of his hair, he tears his clothes, covers in sackcloth and ashes, and crumbles before God in a heap, pleading for repentance, for forgiveness. All right? Now, what we do today, modern-day America, is we say, how dare you tell me anything is wrong? I mean, that's what we do. How dare you tell me my lifestyle is wrong, all right? I'm an American. I do whatever I want. That is the attitude of our culture. The attitude here of truly repentant is brokenness before God. So Ezra leads the people in prayers of repentance. We actually see that in chapter 9 and, and right into the beginning of chapter 10. Well, the good news here is that the people actually do repent. And number two, they make an oath to align themselves with God's Word. All right, they make an oath to align themselves with God's Word. It's always a good thing. Always a good thing to make an oath to align yourself with God's Word. And that's what the people do. And then, number three, the people involved met with the leaders in Jerusalem to rectify the problem. So, over the course of time, it says that they were agreed to come to Jerusalem, to the leaders, and have their case heard. Now here's the thing, because it doesn't fit Ezra's purpose, he's just showing a providential hand of God, moving, not forgetting his people. He doesn't tell us exactly how they resolved it. So I make a proposal here 
that other scholars have made, which I think makes sense. Perhaps as they interviewed these people and they talked to them, if the woman who had been a Canaanite worshiping multiple polytheistic, in other words, all kinds of gods, idols, if she had truly converted to follow the God of Israel, perhaps they allowed that marriage to stand and that woman to stay. We're not told, but they heard each case individually, which means they were evaluating it, all right? If that person was still just as lost as lost could be, I think they were sent back to their pagan land and the marriage was in effect nullified as not being a valid marriage to begin with. We're not told, because it didn't fit Ezra, Ezra's purposes here. So we finished this book, and from start to finish, what a sovereign hand of God is protecting his covenant people. He is telling them, I'm not done with you yet, and against all odds, against any common sense, I can and will accomplish what I want to accomplish. All right, so that's the book of Ezra. Next week, we pick up the book of Nehemiah, also written by Ezra, all right? So... Again, if you missed the first part, a lot of people, Jewish tradition has Ezra and Nehemiah as one book. We have it separated. I think there's a good reason for it to be separated, but the author's the same. It actually flows history-wise right from Ezra right into Nehemiah, and we will uh, study that and once next week. We'll get Nehemiah done one, one time. So if you didn't hear me earlier, I'm going to try and do every book here for quite some time in one, one session to cover an entire book. And then once we get to uh, Psalm, it'll be two. To do 150 Psalms, we'll do it in two. All right? Um, and then we'll try and do one after that until we get to Isaiah, Jeremiah, which will take two. Um, I'll just make them two. They can't be one. There's too much stuff. All right, let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, I'm thankful that as people of the new covenant, those of us who have put our faith and trust in you, that in spite of our failures, in spite of our weakness, that if we will absolutely repent of our sin and come before you in brokenness and humbleness, that you look down on us and you say, I know you, and I am prepared, I am on your side, I am ready to help you. Lord, I'm thankful that indeed you moved us from being enemies to being friends, and even from being outsiders into members of the family of God. Lord, I'm thankful for this little book that allows us to see how ridiculous it is that evil kings will follow things that make no sense for them because you would have it done. And Lord, may you help each one of us to realize that the work we call to do while sometimes looking hopeless is still empowered and led by the same God who overcomes all odds. Help us not to be terrified into, uh, into quitting and into, in, in failing, Lord, and then not getting back up. Lord, may you help each one of us to find our place of ministry and place of worship in uh, honoring and glorifying you in this body. And Lord, I thank you very much for each person who's here today. May you bless us for having been here. May we be better equipped to worship you. Bless the music and the service and the message to follow as Michael delivers that. And Lord, may you help each one of us again to be open to the Spirit's leading. In Jesus' name.